The academic side of the talk is going to be talking about the river line effect, looking for the effect of recreational disturbance on, on freshwater streams in Trinidad. Um, and this is a project that's been going for five years at the University of St Andrews, the University of West Indies, um, and funded by the European Research Council. So before I give my talk, um, this project is part of a wider project that's actually been going on in Scotland, in Brazil, in Trinidad. Um, and there's a short video, about four, four minutes or so, which gives some background. Extinctions of creatures like the dodo or the thylacine wolf are dramatic indications of the impact our species has had on diversity of life in the natural world. Now the only place we can encounter these creatures is in a natural history museum like this one. But our research is showing that it may not be simply the reduction of species that threatens biodiversity, but that the change in composition of species in a particular place is also a critical factor. When studying nature, historical figures such as Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace saw that, like pictures in a collection, the species that go to make up a local community change over time. Some species colonise and grow more abundant, while others become rarer or even become locally extinct. Biodiversity isn't only about how many species there are in a place, how many pictures in a collection if you like, it's also about which species are present in any location. And a critical question today is how much of this turnover of species is due to natural processes and how much is caused by disturbance by us. To begin to answer that question, we've been carrying out research in locations where scientists have a good understanding of the local natural ecology and there's been a growing increase in human disturbance. One such location is the island of Trinidad just off the coast of Venezuela. Trinidad is home to the rich tropical ecosystem of the Northern Range. Researchers from the University of the West Indies and the University of St Andrews have been studying the ecology of the rivers there for some time. The Northern Range is also popular with picnickers who enjoy a river lime. This is a party by the river which involves bathing, cooking and the inevitable disturbance in the form of garbage and noise. We've been studying the communities and biodiversity of these sites as well as at sites where picnickers don't tend to go. By recording details about the fish, the aquatic invertebrates such as dragonfly larvae and unicellular organisms, we've been learning more about these communities. Our study still has another year to go, but it's already clear that change over time is occurring in these places, and that this change is most striking at those sites that picnickers favour. In another study, we've analysed 100 time series from localities all over the world. This is a very large data set. It included over 6 million observations from over 35,000 species. And the systems that we looked at included terrestrial ones, oceans, freshwater systems, and they extended from the tropics to the poles. What these studies showed overall were small changes in the number of species. About half of the community showed slight increases and about half slight decreases. Much more striking was what we found when we examined the types of species in these various natural communities. The composition of species changed substantially, more than would be predicted given natural processes alone, in almost four out of every five of the natural communities studied. The causes for these results are different in different places. For example, sometimes habitats are modified directly by human behaviour, for example the rivers in northern Trinidad, and sometimes invasive animal species move in and modify how ecosystems work. But what this finding, that species composition varies so substantially across the globe, does show is that conservationists need to do more than just counting numbers of species. It's also very important to know which species are present both now 
and in the future to understand how our human behaviour is affecting biodiversity in natural communities throughout the world. Sites. Can you see them? Okay. And so we would, an alternative 
having to set our sites for a whole day or a whole week and count the number of people who were coming to the site. We quantified the human activity by counting the garbage at the site as a sort of uh, approximation to that. We also took a lot of environmental measurements when we were at our site. So this is me measuring the flow of the stream. Um, we also looked at the substrate, whether it was bedrock or gravel or, or large boulders. The flow rate, that's what I'm doing in this picture here. The de depth and width of the river, which varied over the year, as you can imagine, with the rainy season, the dry season. We also looked at water quality parameters, such as temperature and pH. And turbidity, so that's the cloudiness of the water. Um, and, and canopy cover, which we you, uh, measured using this <coughs> instrument here, um, which is a, called a densiometer. It's basically a, a concave mirror, and it allows you to put a number on the amount, the amount of light that's reaching through the leaves to the river, um, which can be quite important to what's living in the river. Uh, so electrofishing is one of the methods we use for our, to catch our fish. We first of all sail with a big sail net, and once we had done that, we would go in again with the electrofishing. So this is Raj Mahavir from UWE, um, who is an expert in using this equipment. So it's an electric current is passing between these two poles, which are attached to a generator on the bank. Now this doesn't need to kill the fish. Um, any fish that pass between these two poles just receive an electric shock, and they're momentarily stunned, at which point Karan will scoop them up with this net and put them in a bucket where they recover and then we weigh them and identify them, and then we release them. So we, all, we always put our fish back at the end of each survey. And this is Karen and I measuring and, and weighing our fish. And over the five years, we found 23 different species um, in those rivers um, from 13 families. And this is about half of the number of species in the whole of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, but then, of course, we were only looking at that quite isolated geographic area, really. We went in the south. And you find a lot of species in South that have come from South America. So, um, but I'll take you through a few of them now, um, seeing as this is a bit of a naturalist for meeting. So there's a silver catfish around here. Now, any of you who went on the Kumaka K trip the other week, um, you may have seen this species in the cave. But of course, this one is not the adapted one for the cave. The one in the cave is the same species, but it shows adaptations to being in the dark. And tends to be a lot smaller. This is, a few, this is, this is like this. Um, yeah. uh, the blue cockscarrow. It's much be more beautiful underwater, beautiful colours and iridescent, but I've never managed to get a photo of that. Uh, potato, hypostomus. So I love this photo here because you can see this very unusual crescent eye. Undulating movement, the uh, thin 
diatom, which shows you it has this 3D structure. So this is the same diatom in these three pictures, but depending on which angle you look at it, um, it looks very different. That's, really, that's an extra level of challenge to my job here, because the same species can, species can look different. It happens to fall on the slide in a different way. Um, so yeah, next. And these are some pictures of what I've been finding in such a diatom. So you can see there's a huge diversity of shapes and sizes and forms of diatom. Uh, unfortunately, nobody has properly documented the diatoms of Trinidad. So I have not been able, in most cases, to identify them to the species level. Uh, the reason I say morpho species is because I take it upon myself to invent groups for these um, to help me with my analyses. So based on what looks similar, um, as far as I can tell with the level of magnification I have access to, um, I group them together as morpho species. And for my analyses, that's, that should be sufficient. Um, although it would be really excellent if somebody would do the equivalent of what Jeffrey has done for the fungi and starts really looking into this, this very overlooked group in, in Trinidad. It would really help um, further studies to know what they all are. Um, so yeah, we've got some crazy shapes and sizes. And oh, I should also mention that these are made of these are actually made of glass, effectively the same stuff, the same compound that we're finding glass. So they they withstand all the acid and the treatment that I give them to get rid of the organic things. And this is this is um, very brittle glass with these beautiful engraved um, marks all over them, which allows you to identify them. They're really unique, and they're photosynthetic, so they're um, they're a primary producer in the ecosystem, and fish and insects in the water will, will be grazing upon these, um, all of these things. So, now you know the basis of what I did while I was surveying the river. I can go back to my original question and tell you what we've been finding out in the most recent. We still have plenty of analysis to do, but we finally published the first paper in December, so I can tell you about that. So this study is focused on the limings. Now, the river lime really is a phenomenon in Trinidad. I've never lived in a country where it's you know, such a <coughs> big part of culture. Spending time in the river um, for religious reasons, for family, for culture, um, for washing, for bathing, um, for lime, or for partying, liming, um, for cooking food. So these are just a few pictures I've taken over the five years at my site. And I should point out that many of these scenes were at 8 a.m. on a Wednesday morning. I mean, it doesn't have to be the weekend. People are doing this all the time. And uh, some of the sites have very good facilities for landing, such as Cora Pool 1, which is where this is taken. That's one of my sites. And others, such as the Upper Cora, which is one of my so-called undisturbed sites, um, people chose to make their own thing, play out of a rock here. So um, that's less good. And of course, when they all leave after the line, this is what's left behind. Um, plenty garbage. And um, yeah. So this is the end of the bit. But you can see this, and this is at least you can you can see this, and you, it's a very obvious sign of what um, the impact of the lining is having. But what is much harder to see with our eyes is the impact it might be having on what's inside the, the river and the water itself and the communities that live there. So that's what we were interested in, in looking into. So we asked whether we could detect the effect of recreational disturbance on freshwater fish communities in Trinidad. And we decided to measure four different sort of levels of community property, as I call them. So the first one, the first three are community level effects. So that's the total fish biomass, which is the weight of all of the fish that we catch at one site at one time. The second is the total fish species richness. And species richness is the same thing as saying the number of species. So not the number of individuals, the number of species that you find at a site. And then we also calculated various diversity indices, and these do take into account the abundance as well as the number of species um, by an equation. There are different indices that have slightly different equations for working this out, but all of them take into account the proportion of individuals um, sort of allocated to each species, whether each... Well, actually, I've, I've got a diagram to tell you more about that in a moment, so I'll leave that for them. And then the population level effects. Um, we decided to look at the guppy because um, the guppy is one of the few fish we find at all of our sites. Um, it varies abundances, but often it's very abundant at, uh, on, at our sites. It's also very fast breeding and has a very short generation time of just three or four months. So we might expect it to be quite adaptable and quite sensitive to change. So um, if there is something that's affecting the population, the guppy might be the first population that 
shows that effect at a population level. So we decided to measure sex ratio because, again, in the guppy that's very easy to measure because um, this is a male and this is a female, so you can tell the difference immediately. Um, and we thought it'd be interesting to see whether um, add an extra level to the, to the picture. So I'll just talk you through these in terms of to, to visualise them a bit better. So biomass. Um, so the, the pool on the left has a higher biomass than the pool on the right, um, but you'll see that the species richness and the abundance is the same in both cases. That's what it shows. It's as simple as that. That's the simplest one to explain. Uh, species richness. So here you can see that there are five species here and three species here, even though the number of individuals has stayed the same. Um, abundance, it's simple, it's just fewer in number, which of course might have an effect on biomass, etc. And then the one that's a bit more complicated to explain is the diversity index, so I hope this help, helps clarify us a little bit. So in these cases, there are the same number of species, the same species richness, there's five different types of fish in both of these pools. There's also the same abundance of fish in each case, but the difference is the diversity. Um, and you can see in this case, the, the individuals are spread perfectly evenly between the different species. So there are three individuals of each species. On this side, one of the species is dominant um, by far. Uh, this is Raboides, just uh, as an illustration. So um, it's showing you that there's a real sort of a shift in the, the, the it's not very evenly distributed, the, abund the abundance between the different species. Um, as a result, you'll see that the picture on the left has a very high diversity index at 0.86, whereas because this is much more skewed towards one species, the diversity index is much lower. So without going into the exact equation that they use to calculate this, um, that's just to illustrate the concept. So there are three different indices that we looked at, all of them do this in a slightly different way, so it'll be slightly different numbers, but um, the, the principle is the same. Uh, sex ratio, simple as that, we calculate it, um, the number of males divided by um, <coughs> total number of fish, so um, that's a 50-50 ratio, and this is very female biased population here. So to summarise again, these are our different indices in green, species richness, biomass, the community level effects, and then we've got the, um, the population level effects in sex ratio. So in the literature before, scientists have tended to just measure one or two of these variables when they're looking for effect of disturbance. Uh, but we decided to do all of them just to see if we found differences and to, to compare whether effects were happening at all or some of these different levels. We used GNN, which are a type of ANOVA, um, which they'll say there. And these are our results. So we <coughs> included all of these, we looked at the different um, of, of human disturbance and, and, if, and whether human activities that based on the amount of garbage we found each site, that was our um, our variable for human disturbance um, against each of these different levels. And we found that biomass um, was actually significantly greater at the more disturbed sites. We found that species richness was significantly greater at the more disturbed sites. We found no evidence of a difference in the proportional measure of diversity, so these indices that show the shift in um, how evenly the abundance is spread among species. And we found significantly more female bias to guppy populations at the more disturbed sites. So I'll go through those results now and uh, speculate a little bit. So the first result, biomass and species richness is greater at sites with higher levels of recreational use. And measures that took into account the proportional abundance of species were not significantly associated with recreational use. So there's a few uh, potential reasons for this. I mean, uh, one is the most obvious is that uh, there may be greater nutrient input at these lining spots. Um, once you have more nutrients going into the water, then from the bottom up, this can increase the biomass in the food web. And if there's more biomass that could be supported, then uh, that's more potential for more species. It's not necessarily a linear relationship, but it could encourage more species to be able to be supported there. Another idea is that um, 
it's not directly the effect of the garbage um, or even the people per se, but it might be that when, when used for a lining site, people might create dams and there may be more pools created and perhaps these kind of habitats encourage certain species to, um, to colonise. <coughs> our next result was that we found more females um, at the more disturbed sites in our guppy populations. Now that's uh, even more delving into speculation, but there is evidence that male guppies are more sensitive to water quality than females. And this is thought to be because they actually invest an awful lot of energy in their courtship and their coloration and their dance and their displays, which you learned about at other lectures here. Um, there's also the chance that predation pressure, um, <coughs> we know that predation pressure can be different for males and females, so perhaps um, the difference in the species richness also then affects um, the sexual age of the guppies. Um, or there may be something else about the sites that could be completely independent of recreation, but it just so happens that all of our recreational sites also have this unknown, unknown um, cause. We can't rule that out. So how do we interpret these results? So the interesting thing as an ecologist is that these effects were detected at the community level and at the population level. Um, and even more important is that it wasn't at all the properties measured, it was just at some of them. Um, so this means that we really do need to consider um, multiple levels when we're looking at the effects of disturbance because just to look at one or two could be quite misleading, you could miss, miss, miss something quite interesting or, or important. Um, so that's a recommendation to, to ecologists and conservation managers. <coughs> um, it's quite hard to me really, I guess, that there, were no, there was no loss of biomass or richness. This suggests some kind of resilience to disturbance in these streams. So they're not so sensitive that all the species are wiped out, for example. Um, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily positive, um, but it also doesn't necessarily mean it's negative. It, is, it could be neutral. We just don't know. Um, but we know there is a change. That's as much as we can say. And really, the, the most important implication is that when interpreting this and looking for the literature, it's clear that we need to do an awful lot more research to confidently interpret these kind of results um, in order to then um, manage our, our biodiversity. So um, what, do these, what do these mean for the ecosystem, for the function of the ecosystem? Um, if there's more biomass, um, what are the knock-on effects of that to the community? We're not really sure. Um, the other thing that um, I've been very aware of doing this study is that we have to consider the benefits that people gain by being near and on the river. Um, connecting with nature is something that people do less and less, and in many ways, it, um, river lining can be seen as a form of ecosystem service uh, when managed well. So people who enjoy being by the river and using the river for any reason are much more likely to want to conserve it um, and appreciate it. Um, in their lives. So I don't think the way to go is to say people should, shouldn't be by the rivers. I mean, that's, that, that wouldn't be the, um, a sensible way to go at all. However, a few potential recommendations, and perhaps people here have some further ideas. Um, one would be to have, like in Cora, have designated well-maintained lining spots, which means that people would use these spots and not spill over into the more pristine areas um, causing the more disturbance in pristine, in pristine places. At these sites you need more bins. I mean, again and again I just saw people thinking that putting their garbage in a bag and leaving it on the side of the river was the same as taking it home. Of course, within minutes or hours, a dog or a corvo has um, ripped over the bag and it's back in a worse state than it was when they arrived. So, um, some of the upper sites perhaps need garbage trucks to come more frequently or CPEP to be involved in uh, maintaining these, these sites. And then, of course, education, which is something that's close to the club's heart. So, um, generally, I mean, this is a display that um, I worked with El Socorro Wildlife um, Centre with last year, where Ricardo and I created a display with um, examples of about 20, 20 or so species of the fish from our rivers. And then school children and members of the public were able to see these, and so many of them had no idea that there were that many different fish in our rivers, um, and, and all the facts that we could tell them about them. So by, by learning about what's there, people are more likely to appreciate again. Uh, also more directly, I mean, perhaps we should be putting information boards at some of these um, landing sites with information on the biodiversity um, to, to communicate with people at the place where it's happening. And anybody who's interested in the more technical side of things, this is the, the paper 
that, all, that the last section of the talk is described in. Um, it's in a peer-reviewed journal, but it's open access, so any, any computer, anybody would be able to see the full text. Um, if you're more interested in some more pictures, then I've been keeping a blog for most of the project with lots of stories and pictures, <coughs> this URL here, and also at my website I put up um, various um, posts related to this work. Um, so thank you very much for listening and